I just had an idea pop into my head about something to do this coming weekend, and I wanted to bounce it off you two before it slips my mind. My friend Natasha said those words as the three of us sat on my couch one afternoon. I found myself sitting up slightly. Normally, Natasha was the last of our group to suggest things to do, letting Vinny, the third member of our group, or I come up with the plans to keep our free time occupied. The fact she was about to suggest something intrigued me. What have you got in mind? I asked her. A smile played over her face as her brown eyes seemed to flash. How about a little ghost hunting? I felt Vinny sit straight up beside me. She had clearly grabbed both our attention now. The three of us were what you might call amateur ghost hunters, using very basic items we bought offline to visit some of the spookier places in the area and posting our adventures on YouTube, sort of like a crappier version of ghost adventures. Now that's one hell of a good idea, Vinny said, before a puzzled expression spread over his face. But, I mean, where? We've already done most of the places around town. The Tioga building won't let us in after that. Well, with that one resident claims we stirred up in the old ballroom, and I'm not about to make the hours long drive to the Wolf Creek Inn, Natasha's smile grew wider. No, we don't have to even go out of town for this one, she said, her voice dropping low. What I'm suggesting is we check out. Her voice trailed off, letting the suspense grow for a few seconds before finishing the Egyptian theater. Instantly, Vinny let out a harsh bark of laughter. Now that's a good one. You know damn good and well that the society that runs the theater won't allow us in after hours to ghost hunt. As far as I know, they've never allowed any paranormal teens into the place. He pulled a face. So, how exactly do you propose we get in there? You flutter your eyelashes for the night janitor and use your feminine charms to get us in. Natasha still grinned, but rolled her eyes at our friend's quip. No, actually, I was thinking about using my lockpicking skills to get us in, she declared. It was my turn to give her an incredulous look. You're joking, right? I asked. She shook her head. Nope, I'm dead serious. I let out an incredulous, almost baffled snort of laughter and pulled my glasses off my face, rubbing my eyes. The country and, to a large extent, the entire world became gripped in an interest, sometimes bordering on obsession with all things Egyptian when King Tut's tomb was discovered over a century ago. Many things came out of this, including the classic 1932 monster movie, The Mummy. But one thing that also came of this fever gripping the country was a desire to build many Egyptian style buildings, and one of the buildings which took this design and ran with it were the movie theaters. A decade after the legendary discovery, over a hundred theaters had gone up all around the country, their interiors clad with fake temple columns, paintings of sphinxes and Egyptian gods such as Anubis decorating the walls, and hieroglyphs adorning the archways. People flocked in droves to them, both to watch movies and live performances, but like all trends, eventually, the interest began to wane, and as the late 20th century approached, many began to shut down and be either remodeled or straight up demolished. Today, there's only between five and eight Egyptian-style theaters left in the entire country, and one just so happens to be right in the town I live in. When I moved to Coos Bay, Oregon nine years ago, I immediately fell in love with the place. Even though it's the largest coastal town on the Oregon coast, it's a place which is more or less perpetually frozen in time, still looking pretty much as it did between 30 and 70 years ago. And, as someone who is not exactly into the modern world, it made a perfect place for me to live and escape away from the 21st century. I began exploring right away, driving every street of it in the town neighboring it, North Bend, along with walking every alley and back road so I could learn the layout. That's how I learned about the supernatural element to the town. There are many places in town which people claim supernatural occurrences take place. From the remains of the old logging buildings on the estuary to the old Tioga Hotel which has been remodeled into apartments, there is no shortage of ghostly tales. There was even the old Macaulay Hospital, which had once been the focal point of the town's annual ghost walks until it was demolished in 2018. As a side note, I heard a rumor that a couple people broke into that place right before it got torn down. Something sure spooked them because a friend of mine on the police force told me they gave him a fright 
bursting in the night before Easter and rambling about something. I always wondered what they saw in there, but for me, the place in town I always loved the most and enjoyed the most hearing about the ghostly accounts told was the Egyptian Theater, originally built as a garage in 1922. It was renovated by a man named Charles Noble into a movie theater in 1925, where it drew in droves of people from around the area to watch films and enjoy live vaudeville performances. It continued to operate almost to the end of the 20th century when other theaters began to attract younger moviegoers, and for a while, it almost seemed as though the historic building might even be closed for good and gutted. But, thanks to the efforts of local preservation societies, it was saved and now operates as a theater once again. They mostly play only older movies, along with live performances. And, of course, it draws curious people for the paranormal rumors surrounding it. For years, people have reported strange occurrences happening inside the building, both when it's open and after hours. Patrons and employees alike have spoken about a pervasive feeling of being watched inside the building, but finding no one there when the place was searched. There have been reports of being touched by invisible hands, a few even pushed slightly. Beyond physical interaction, employees have reported the sounds of old film projectors playing and unseen audiences laughing after hours, along with the eerie playing of the theater's pipe organ, along with a host of other occurrences. No ghost hunting team has ever gone in to try and document these events. And to Natasha, that was too good of an opportunity to pass up, legal or not. Are you insane? Vinny exclaimed, Do you have any idea how much trouble we'd be in if we got caught breaking and entering? The cops around here are already a bit twitchy with the homeless. You want to give them a reason to throw us into jail alongside them? Natasha held up a finger, flipping her black hair over her shoulder. They won't find out because I have not one, but two aces in the hole here. The first is that thanks to being friends with Scott, I know the nighttime police sweeps where they're going to be in everything. There'll be an hour long window where they're not anywhere near the alley where the back door to the theater is. We can get in and out with no threat of being spotted at all. And the second is, did you forget I'm dating Dylan now? The realization washed over me like a wave. She had started dating the man who helped the preservation society run the theater a month or so ago. Damn, she's been planning this one for a while, I thought. Vinny had a thoughtful look on his face, his green eyes darting around rapidly, but not seeing. Hum, he muttered, then looked at Natasha. And you're sure that there's no chance of us getting caught? He asked slowly. Absolutely none, she said, then looked at both of us. So, how about it? For a few moments, there was silence, and then Vinny let out a chuckle. What the hell, why not? The most exciting thing we've done the last few weeks is go down to the farmer's market. This could shake things up a bit. I suddenly became aware that the two of them were looking at me, waiting for me to make my decision. I was always the most sensible of the three of us, doing all I could to keep us out of trouble, with others as well as the law. But, I always had one nasty Achilles heel ever since I had been a child, and that was peer pressure. So, despite the overwhelming feeling that I should tell them no, that I should say we should just find something else to do, I nodded. Alright, let's do it, I said simply, causing grins to break out out on both of my friends' faces. I wish to God in retrospect that I'd just had the damn spine to stand up and say no. The rest of the week seemed to pass by faster than usual. Before I knew it, the weekend had arrived. We decided that late Friday night would be the best time to do this, as most places downtown closed up between 11 and midnight, aside from the bars and strip club. To say I felt anxious about breaking the law, something I wasn't used to doing at all, would be like calling a shark a goldfish, but my worries about disappointing my friends ended up outweighing it. And so, at 11.30, the three of us piled into my beat-up Chevy Tahoe and made our way towards downtown. As I drove us down Ocean Boulevard, which connected the two sides of town, something settled over me. I can't exactly place it, even to this day, but it was the most uneasy feeling I've ever experienced but I did my best to push it away. It's nothing, Troy. It's just because you're, understandably, worried about this. Plus, the road being deserted isn't helping much. My mental chiding seemed to help center me a bit, which was a good thing. The road was now angling downward, and a moment later, we drove into downtown. The darkened shapes of the closed stores seemed to rise up higher on either side of us than they looked during the daytime. We decided to cruise by the front entrance first, just to see if anyone were still inside. As as I turned the truck onto the main drag, the sign for the theater rose high above us, a depiction of an Egyptian pharaoh next to the yellow and white letters which proclaimed its name to everyone who drove through town. 
I spared a glance as we passed it. The lit up marquee windows showed that the Blues Brothers and Jaws would be shown soon. For whatever reason, though, I couldn't bring myself to look through the glass doors that showed the building's darkened interior. The uneasy feeling had returned, and, for a moment, it felt as though if I did look, I would see someone or something staring back out at me. And then we passed it, taking the next right and looping back around to Anderson Avenue. I turned the truck into the narrow alley drive which ran along the back of the theater and neighboring buildings. Parking right next to the rear doors would be extremely conspicuous, so I pulled up a bit further and parked in a carport-like area. Shutting off the engine, I turned to my two friends. Well, this is it I said, last chance to turn back if anyone's having second thoughts. I'd hoped that either Vinny or Natasha would have gotten cold feet in the last few minutes, allowing us to go do something else. But there was no such luck. Are you kidding me? Natasha said from the passenger seat, we are far too close to back out now. Vinny grunted from behind me, well, shit. Resigning myself to the fact they were determined to go through with this, I let a deep breath out through my nose and nodded. The others opened their doors and hopped out. A moment later, I followed. The night air was cool and crisp on my skin as we slowly walked back down the alley to the rear of the yellowish, tan building. Three different sets of red double doors were built into the back of the theater. Natasha pulled something out of her coat pocket, and I realized, with a small pang of surprise, that it was a lockpick set. A legitimate lockpick set. Where the hell did you get that? I whispered to her. She shrugged and smiled. I have my ways of getting things she said simply, then pointed to the far right set of doors. We'll have a bit of cover from that electrical box. You two keep an eye out while I deal with the lock and with that, she scurried forward, bending down in front of the door handles. Vinny and I stood guard, each of us looking down both ends of the alley. As the soft sound of Natasha messing with the lock filtered over to me, I realized just how quiet it was, and how eerie hearing downtown so quiet was. Aside from a few distant booms and bangs, and the far off sound of a dog barking, all I could hear was the whistle of the wind as it whipped between the old buildings. An involuntary shiver ran up my spine, and I tried again to reason myself back to a relative sense of calm. Get a grip, dude, you're gonna be fine, I whispered under my breath. But this time, it felt as though I were able to entirely convince myself. I suddenly became aware of a creeping sensation, one which made me shoot a look around. Nothing moved in the still no indication of anyone besides us being in the alley, and, yet, I was overcome with the distinct feeling of being watched, not by either of my friends, but by someone else. Before I had a chance to even think about it, I heard a rather loud click, and Natasha let out a soft laugh of triumph. We're in, ladies and gentlemen, she declared, standing up and pulling on the door. It opened silently, the streetlight in the alley casting a small shaft of light into the darkness beyond. Turning, she waved an arm at Vinny and I, come on, let's get inside. Before either of us could say anything, she turned and disappeared into the dark. I shot a look at Vinny, who simply shrugged. After you, my man, he whispered. I let out a deep sigh and then moved to the door. Reaching into my pocket, I pulled out the small flashlight and then pulled on the heavy metal, slipping inside, Vinny right behind me. The darkness swallowed us as the door closed. For a moment, a small rush of panic from not being able to see flashed through me before a light appeared beside me. It wasn't from a flashlight, though. Instead, a small, orange flame flickered beside me. Don't turn on your flashlights yet, just follow me, Natasha said, the flame making her face seem to dance and move behind it. She turned and headed away, leaving us no choice but to follow. I listened to her and didn't turn on my flashlight, but every fiber of my being was screaming at me too, because the feeling of being watched out in the alleyway had quintupled in here. The best way to describe it was that we were angrily being stared at, and I didn't like the sensation one bit. Natasha led us up a flight of steps and pushed open another door. We're here, she said, still keeping her voice low. You can turn on your flashlights now. Thank you, God. I silently said, snapping mine on and casting a bright white light into the room we'd entered. A moment later, so did my two friends' lights. The beans played around, and I heard Vinny let out a bit of a gasp. Holy shit, he muttered. Natasha had guided us into the main theater. The ceiling rose high above our heads, almost out of sight of even the flashlights. Rows upon rows of red movie seats stretched out and away from us, seeming almost unending in the shadows. The walls were all covered in hieroglyphs, all still original from the 1920s. To our left, the second story, which housed a smaller row of seats, along with the projection room rose about 20 feet above us, and to the right was the stage itself. It was full 
flanked by two huge columns, the screen rolled up and revealing a mosaic of an Egyptian building on the back wall, with two men clutching staff sitting on either side. Directly in front of the stage sat the organ, its seating bench tucked beneath it. Okay, this is a trip to be in at night. Natasha exclaimed excitedly, then pulled the backpack she'd been wearing off her shoulders. Dropping it into a seat, she unzipped it and began pulling items from it. Guys, here, she said, holding them out. Vinny stepped forward and grabbed the camcorder from her. As someone who'd had a lifelong dream of being a filmmaker, he was our resident cameraman. I stepped forward and took two items from her, an infrared thermometer and an EVP recorder. The rest, she placed on the ground and then faced Vinny. All right, tell me when you're recording. He fumbled with the camcorder for a second, then shot her a thumbs up. Instantly, she took on a somber, eerie expression, giving an admittedly creepy look at the camera. Well, welcome back to the Three Ghosketeers, everyone. I hope you all have been well since our last trip. Tonight, you join us in a very, very special place and one close to home for us. We are currently in the Egyptian Theater in Coos Bay, Oregon, one of the last remaining in the country. It was built in the 1920s by a man named Charles Noble. I turned away, tuning her out as I did. The woman really enjoys being in front of the camera, better her than me. Shining my light around, I looked up at the balcony. I could see the small hole in the projection booth where the movie projector would shine out onto the screen. Something caught the beam's light, reflecting off it slightly, and I aimed a light at the wall. It was a wrought iron light fixture, one which had been shaped into the figure of a king cobra, posing to strike. Gazing around, I saw they adorned much of the walls. I let out a small shudder at it. God, do I hate snakes. Thankfully, though, the feeling of being watched I'd had in the alley in the darkened back of the theater had seemingly disappeared. Yeah, see, what I tell you, Troy, nothing but your nerves. Natasha had finished her opening monologue and moved to the edge of the stage, on which she placed a small, square spirit box. And now, let's see if anyone would like to speak with us, she said, flicking it on. Instantly, the silence of the theater was shattered by the sound of static, intermittently interrupted by quick snippets of radio shows being picked up. Is there anyone here who'd like to talk to us? She called out into the huge room. The static and snippets were the only sound to answer her. After a minute, she tried again. Are there any spirits who'd like to communicate with us? There was still nothing. Then he panned the camera from the box to Natasha as she paced back and forth for a few minutes. A small look of disappointment flooded over her face, but she instantly plastered it over with the same look she'd given the camera before. Well, it looks like the spirit box isn't gonna work tonight, so we're gonna have to try something else. She pulled out an EVP recorder identical to mine and switched it on. Let's try this instead, shall we? Remember, by the way guys, if you're new here and want to see more, to like and subscribe. I turned away again, feeling a small pang of irritation flow through me. This is freaking ridiculous, man. The longer we stay in here, the more chance we have of getting caught. Truth be told, as much as I enjoyed ghost hunting, I didn't even really believe in the paranormal. In all the years the three of us had filmed together, not once had we caught anything, on tape or otherwise. In fact, many times we'd had to fake spooky occurrences in order to make sure our videos got any views at all. This is your own fault, man. I silently chided myself, you're the one who couldn't stand up to them and say no. You really, seriously need to grow in a spine and learn how to say no. The mental self lecture was furthering my rotten mood, and I began to feel a wave of anger at my two friends, as well as myself boil up. Hell with this, I finally muttered, then turned and began walking up the aisle. Troy, where the hell are you going? I heard Natasha call out behind me. I stopped, not looking over my shoulder, but quietly aiming my voice behind me and allowing a hint of irritation to seep into it. I'm gonna go check out the second floor balcony, okay? I don't exactly like just standing here. For a moment, there was silence, and then her voice came, soft and almost apologetic. Okay, go ahead. Before she could say anything more, I strode away, walking to the open doorway which led out of the theater and into the concession area. I hooded my flashlight beam with one hand to make sure it wouldn't accidentally shine out of the glass entrance doors into the street and looked around. The lobby and concession stand took up most of the front area, the darkened shape of it stretching along the far wall. Taking a few steps ahead, I turned and looked up at the wall above me. Large, blue letters stretched out from one side of it to the other. Through these doors passed the most wonderful people. I snorted softly. Yeah, unfortunately, not tonight. I shook my head, then looked around. 
and nearly jumped out of my skin. Something also seemed to jump back. I felt my heartbeat begin to race in my chest and my breath quickened. Shit. I let out weakly, then slowly moved forward. After a few steps, I suddenly realized what I'd seen and let out a soft laugh of relief. Your own damn reflection, you fucking pussy. Shaking my head, I turned away from the glass wall and headed for the stairs to the second floor. At the base of them, I stopped and shined my flashlight up. Ooh, boy, I said quietly. Sitting next to the stairway like a sentry was a huge, golden statue of a pharaoh. It towered over me, and I estimated that, were it be standing straight up, it'd easily be between 8 and 10 feet tall. It stared straight ahead at the wall ahead of it, and I couldn't help but let out a small shiver as I stared at it. It just seemed so damn eerie in the dark, and I quickly moved past it, heading up the stairs and stepping out onto the second story balcony. I shined my light around. Red seats again surrounded me, though this time far fewer. Ahead of me, I could see the balcony's edge and the hulking shape of the main stage beyond. I could also see the beams of my friend's flashlights playing over it, and hear both of their voices speaking softly. Deciding while I was up here to at least check out the projection booth, I strode over to the door and tried to turn the handle. It was locked. Feeling my irritation bubble over into exasperation, I jiggled the handle in some stupid attempt to open it but the door stayed shut. I turned away and rubbed my eyes, again hearing the voices of my friends softly filtering up to me from down below. Hey, if there really are any ghosts, or spooks, or specters, or whatever in here, if you're actually real, could you appear to us, please? I whispered to no one, that way my friends can get what they want and I can go home. I received only silence in reply. I hadn't really expected anything, anyways. You know what? Screw this, I'm going back down there and telling them I'm going home, with or without them. This is beyond stupid, I just broke the law for what? For nothing, for something dumb as hell. And with that, I turned to walk away, but I hadn't even taken a single step when something crashed into me like a wave. The breath was driven from my lungs as I felt a massive chill shoot through me as though I'd been doused with ice water. What the fuck? I hissed through gritted teeth, then froze, my eyes going wide. The feeling of being watched had returned with a vengeance, and it had seemingly been ramped up in its intensity. I shot a look around, but saw nobody. Still, the feeling remained, and with each passing second, it almost seemed to grow stronger. Chill after chill rolled up my spine, and even though I didn't really believe, something deep inside me told me that it it was time to get out. Okay, time to leave, I said in my head and headed quickly for the stairs. As I reached the head, I turned to look back one final time. That's when I saw something. It disappeared when I aimed my flashlight at it, but I swear a second earlier, it had been the outline of a person standing in the shadows and watching me. The split second sight catapulted me into motion and I hurried down the steps, shining my light every which way but loose. Believe it or not, I knew something wanted us out. I'd planned on jumping off the second to last stair and running for the main theater floor, but as I reached the bottom, I froze. For a moment, I couldn't place why, and then, the realization fell over me like a tsunami. I let out an involuntary gasp, and fear like I'd never felt before surged through me. I didn't want to turn around and look. I wanted to pretend I hadn't seen it. I desperately wanted to, but, like a dumbass character in a horror movie, I couldn't help it. I needed to look. I slowly turned, aiming my flashlight back up, and I couldn't help but let out a strangled scream, falling backwards, over my own feet as I began to backpedal rapidly. The statue of the pharaoh still sat where it had. It still towered over me, looking as imposing and eerie as ever, but its carved and painted eyes were no longer staring straight ahead at the wall. Instead, they had somehow moved. And when I'd turned, I'd come to find they were staring directly at me. I scrambled to my feet, snatching the flashlight from the floor where I'd dropped it and aiming it at the statue again. It stared straight out at nothing again, but I knew what I'd seen. It hadn't been a trick of my mind or the light. The freaking thing's eyes had moved to watch me as I passed down by it. I began to stammer out as I backed away from it. Okay, that's it. No, we're done here. Fuck this shit. I'm officially a believer. We're leaving. Right now, I kept backing towards the doorway to the theater, never taking my eyes off the statue. I was terrified I'd seen it suddenly stand up and turn to lumber after me like Boris Karloff or something. The blaring sound of the theater's organ slashed through the silence, causing me to let out another strangled scream and jump almost a foot off the ground. I whipped around, thinking I would see my moronic friends tinkering with the instrument. Instead, I froze again. The theater was no longer dark. 
Both of my friends had seemingly vanished from the room as I could no longer see them. The movie screen had somehow been pulled down and above me I heard the whir of the movie projector playing. An old, black and white movie, one which had no sound, played on the screen, occasionally changing to show dialogue being displayed in white letters. It was also no longer empty. The entire theater was packed. I saw people sitting at almost every single seat in the huge room. I could only see the backs of their heads as they watched the movie playing. At the edge of the stage, what looked like a man now sat at the organ, playing it in time with the film. A slapstick moment came across the screen, and the audience began laughing. In any other situation, it would have been a comforting sound. But at that moment, it was the most spine-chilling sound I'd ever heard, especially as another wave of realization crashed into me. From the little I could see, everyone in the theater looked to be dressed in long past fashions. That's when the voice, low and quiet, came from behind me. Good evening, sir, it said. It sounded like a man's voice, one rather low and deep-pitched, but something about it paralyzed me on the spot. The voice continued, putting on an air of pleasant politeness. We're so glad you could make it. It's been so long since we've had new patrons arrive at a showing. If I could just see your ticket, please. For a moment, I couldn't speak. Then, I managed to squeak out two words. Ticket. The tone of the voice seemed to change somewhat. Yes, your ticket. That's the only way you could have gotten in. Please, let me verify it and show you to your seat. Oh, shit. Whoever, or whatever the voice belonged to, thought I had shown up like a regular movie goer. The voice's tone became less polite. You do have a ticket, right, sir? I was beyond terrified to answer, but I was more terrified to remain silent. For a moment, I considered lying, but I feared what might happen if I did, so I told the truth. I, um, I don't have a ticket, sir, I stammered out, my voice barely above a whisper. Instantly, all sound stopped in the room like someone had flipped a switch. You don't have a ticket, the voice said, all pretense of manners vanishing from it. Then how did you get in here for the late night showing? Oh, God. I forced myself to speak, still unable to say anything except the truth. My friends and I broke in through the back door to ghost hunt. There was silence for a few moments, and then a heavy hand dropped onto my shoulder. My head swiveled to look at it. Oh, fuck me sideways. It wasn't a regular hand. It was a fucking claw. One with black skin, tipped with what looked like razor sharp nails. It sat there for a moment, then tightened, almost painfully so, making me let out a small whimper of pain. That's when I looked up. Everyone in the theater had turned to look at me. My initial thought had been correct. They all wore clothing from almost a century ago, and not the stuff cosplayers wear, either. They also had very angry expressions on their faces, as if they'd just noticed the intruder among their midst. The voice finally came again, almost directly behind me, its tone lowered, almost sounding guttural and animal, making my legs almost melt into jelly from the fear. Then, might I make a suggestion to you and your trespassing little friends? My breath came in rapid, ragged gasps, and I barely managed to force out the one word. Yes, leave. At the single word reply, which now more closely resembled a growl than a word, I did something I will forever wish I hadn't. I finally turned and looked up at who was addressing me. The only way I can describe what happened is, my mind shattered. The next thing I remember, I was crashing into the back doors of the theater into the night. And I was screaming. That was a month or so ago. When I'd stumbled back into the alley, I'd turned and, in what I can only call blind fear and panic, bolted for my truck. I hadn't even heard my friends chasing after me, not until Vinny caught up to me as I scrambled with my keys, grabbing me from behind and turning me to face him. He said the look I'd had on my face scared him and Natasha more than anything ever had before. I'd been pale as a sheet, my eyes wider than they ever thought a human's could be. I'd been babbling softly. I'd been saying the words, they want us to leave over and over. They didn't ask me what had happened. They just pushed me into the backseat of my truck and drove away from there. It was clear, as I found out later on, that both of them hadn't seen anything. As far as they were concerned before seeing me dash to the rear doors, it was just an empty theater. Neither one of them ever asked me what I saw that night. And for that, I'm thankful, because I could never utter from my lips what I did see, but I've had nightmares since then, horrible ones, ones that have been so bad, I had to let out what happened to me, deciding to just post it here regardless of whether people believe me or not.
Nightmares about being back in that theater after hours. About seeing that pharaoh statue's eyes flick in its painted sockets to look at me. About seeing all those people, people long since dead, sitting and watching the films they did when they were alive. About seeing that hand fall on my shoulder, hearing that voice, telling me not to come back until I have a ticket. And about turning to see who the hand and voice belong to. The Egyptian theater will be celebrating its centennial this year. People are planning to show up in 1920s cars, dressed in period clothing. They are even going to show an old, silent film as part of the festivities. But I won't be attending it. I won't ever go anywhere near it again. The one time I tried, a week or so ago, I started trembling with fear. And the mental image played over and over in my head. The image of turning to see that horrible canine head attached to the human-like body, red, glowing eyes, glaring down at me as its sharp teeth glinted in the light. I pray to God I never will end up with a ticket to one of its late night showings, but I can't help but fear that, like those packed into the theater, sooner or later, we all will. Thank you to my super fans, Sweet Black Swan, Tacey, and Brooklyn. I really appreciate you guys supporting my channel, and I look forward to making more content for everyone.